All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, how many people are actual developers in the room? Sysadmins? No sysadmin? One sysadmin. Is that you? They raise your hand for sysadmin or developer? Uh, okay, <laughs> no sysadmins. All right, great. <laughs> Um, so, my name is Grant Shipley. I am a developer evangelist at Red Hat. Um, I've been at Red Hat about seven years. Before Red Hat, I worked at a, another uh, small Linux company called Novell on the SUSE operating system. And before that, I worked at a company called SCO, um, SCO, some people call it, Santa Cruz Operations, um, that had a Unix layer and an open server um, operating system. So, I've been a Unix and Linux guy my entire career, which has been about uh, probably 17 years at this point since I graduated college. Uh, but you don't really care about me, so uh, we'll move on. Um, the slides are a little off-center just a little bit because of the projector, so I apologize for that. So today what I'm going to talk about is developing mobile applications using MongoDB as the back end, all hosted in the cloud. Okay, a lot, of, a lot of buzzwords can be associated with that. But for you to understand the talk, I do need to take a couple of minutes and just go over some background information. Um, has anyone actually heard of Titanium Studio before? Okay, about four people, five people. So I started um, developing mobile applications when the first iPhone came out, which was on the Edge network. This was probably, I guess, five years ago at this point. And I have been a Java developer my entire career, and when I decided to develop iPhone applications, it was really hard for me because I had to uh, learn Objective-C. And I haven't used C or C++ since my college days. I went to University of Tennessee. And I had to remember a lot of things that I had forgotten. Like when you allocate memory for an object, you have to deallocate it, or you're going to have memory leaks. I had to learn the Xcode integrated development environment. Um, I had to learn to use the profiling tools because I don't care like how great of a developer we, we think we are. If you're developing native mobile applications in Objective-C, you are going to have memory leaks that you're going to, to trace down um, and try to profile and get fixed. And so the first iPhone application I wrote was called Signing Time. Um, and it was uh, pretty popular back in the day. Um, and it's a sign language application that teaches toddlers how to communicate um, via sign language before they can actually speak. And so as a mobile developer, I knew that I could not create creative content that people would actually care about purchasing an app for. I just, I just knew that I could. And so I actually partnered with this company, Signing Time, and we did a split revenue sharing model because they had all the content. They have shows on Nickelodeon. They won Emmy Awards for their thing. And mobile development was getting pretty hot. So my idea was I'm going to go around to companies and I'm going to pitch to them that I'll write their application for free and get it out in the App Store, and then we will do a 50-50 split of revenue. And so for every dollar that I made, um, I would give them 50, no, I wouldn't. For every dollar I made, I would give Apple 30 cents, and then we would split uh, the remainder. And that worked out pretty well for me. And then I had this other idea that, um, you know, you're still capped by how many people are willing to pay for your application. So I said, I'm going to go around to these uh, companies and I'm going to pitch them an idea that I'll develop their application for them, no charge, and we should give it away for free because it's a marketing effort for them, but they have to pay me five cents every time someone downloads it, right? And, and so that's another model that I chose. So the applications that I wrote, um, I was a pure Objective-C guy. Let me log off of IRC a second. I'm a total developer because I'm still on IRC now. With that, start the presentation back up. Sorry about that. And so to write that first application took me two months, working 40 hours a week. And then because the application was uh, uh, pretty popular, the company wanted me to write it for the Android SDK, which Google released a couple of years later. And I was just doing this in my spare time, and I didn't want to spend the extra time to maintain two code bases and uh, two code streams to learn yet another SDK to publish on the Android um, devices. And I never did it, okay? And so a couple of years later, I thought I just signed out of that. Maybe it's a video memory buffer, I don't know. But a couple of years later, I heard of this company called Accelerator, who has a product called Titanium Studio. It is open source. And you can write native mobile applications using JavaScript. 
A competitor to Titanium Studio would be PhoneGap. A lot of people have probably heard of that or Cordova. Um, Adobe just bought them about, I don't know, eight months ago. And so they're very similar. I'm not saying one is better than the other one. I just chose to um, use Titanium Studio. So it is an Eclipse-based IDE. It's open source. You can build and test your mobile applications from right inside of your IDE. You can set breakpoints and actually debug your code on the uh, um, device and emulators. And it gets compiled down to a native executable using Xcode for the iPhone or the Android SDK um, for Android devices. They also support Blackberry, but we all know where that's going, right? How many people are using Blackberries anymore? Um, they are um, back, backed by the company Accelerator. How Accelerator makes their money and why this is open source is they actually have a marketplace to where developers can submit their own modules for you to use. If I was wanting to write an iPhone application or an Android application that scans barcodes and look up information, I could write that myself. It would take me a long time. Or I could just buy a barcode scanning module through the Accelerator Marketplace. It's like $4 a month. And just integrate that directly into my app. Yep? Are there limitations to this approach? Absolutely. Uh, you wouldn't want to develop a graphics intensive game or application using Accelerator and Type so, so it's because it's more like content centric? That's yeah, this, this would, I would recommend using this, even though Accelerator says you can use it for everything, even including Angry Birds, if you want to add a, write an app like that. I, I personally use it for productivity based applications and not games. Is that, I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, but Titanium Studio is, is actually all JavaScript. It's not really HTML5. And I'll show you some code in a second. We'll walk through an application that I wrote. So the next bit of background information is MongoDB. Um, hopefully most people have heard about MongoDB. But it is a perfect fit for mobile application development in Titanium Studio. So why do I say that? MongoDB is a document uh, object store using JSON. And because you use JavaScript to write these mobile applications, you can just send the JSON object down to the mobile device without having to basically do anything with it, and then just JSON.parse it on the inside of Titanium Studio. So it alleviates all of those uh, used to be concerns for me using like object relational mapping software like Hibernate or something like that to get a data set back, map it to objects, uh, package it up in JSON, send it across the wire. And so it saves a, a developers a lot of time in order to do that. And obviously MongoDB is actually built with scalability and performance and, and high availability in mind. All right, the next part is uh, cloud computing. Yeah. So I actually The lot of data might be very internal to your system and you do not want to expose it. So you want to need a mapping data all the time. Yeah, sure. When I was talking about mapping later, I was talking more of like mapping results that from like a traditional uh, relational database into objects and then passing that across the wire. But yeah, you're right. Like if you have a huge document, um, and depending on how you have your data uh, schema, for lack of a better word, defined. Um, yeah, <laughs> I said for lack of a better word. Um, you, you may want to do some modifications to the uh, JSON document before you pass it back. Absolutely. All right. Um, the next part is cloud computing. So everyone's heard of cloud computing, right? We all sit in our cubes all day long. Our manager, our CIO comes by and says, cloud, 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 cloud. We have to move everything to the cloud. We got to move to the cloud yesterday. It's the future. Why aren't we there yet? And there's all these promises around cloud computing, and it's all just a bunch of BS. It's all just a bunch of hype, right? But there's some very real uh, benefits of using cloud computing. So cloud computing is not going to solve all these problems. It's not going to save the world. It's not going to fix your terrible code or my terrible code. And hopefully you guys have seen this commercial by a popular vendor where there's a family sitting around looking at vacation photos. And they're, they're not very great photos. And the wife says, to the cloud, and suddenly the cloud fixes these vacation photos, right? 
So, you know, there's a lot of promise behind the cloud, and it, it reminds me of the Gartner hype cycle. Has anyone seen this before? So, the Gartner hype cycle is a graph for any new technology that comes out. And it basically says that when a new technology comes out, everyone's going to be talking about it. And it's going to solve all of your problems. And then people realize, well, it's really not. It's just a bunch of hype. But over time, they start to see some real benefits to it. And then the second curve is where people actually start adopting it. We went through this as an industry um, not too long ago with virtualization. Everything we heard about and read about and as, as an industry was virtualization. We're only getting 50% you know, server utilization. We've got to get up to 100% for whatever reason. So virtualization, virtualization, virtualization. That's all we heard about. And today, we don't really you know, talk about it that much because we're basically all using it, right? Most data centers are virtualized. Amazon EC2 is a virtualized environment. We're using virtualization even on our desktop to take snapshots of our development environments, um, things like that. And, and every technology goes through this. And this is what cloud is going through right now. Um, it's at the, the top of the hype cycle, in my opinion. But there's actually three parts to cloud computing. So if someone comes up to you and starts talking about cloud computing, unless they're talking about one of these three areas, they have no idea what they're talking about, in my opinion. And the three areas are infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. So the first piece is infrastructure as a service. The most famous infrastructure as a service is Amazon EC2. Has everyone heard of it? Anyone not heard of Amazon EC2? Okay, so Amazon EC2 is probably at the far right because it seems half the internet is using Amazon EC2 today. Um, when they have an outage like they did a month ago in their US East availability zone, uh, probably an hour went by and my cell phone rang and it was my wife. She was like, I think you forgot to pay the cable modem bill. I can't get on Pinterest. I'm like, what? I didn't forget to pay the cable modem bill? What are you talking about? And then my son calls me when he gets home from school and says, hey, Dad, I think you messed up the computer. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, I can't get on Netflix. I can't watch Netflix. And so we are, as an industry, almost dependent on Amazon EC2 and infrastructure as a service today. A lot of the big players, uh, Netflix included, uh, you know, Heroku, a lot of people are on EC2 today. And we can say whether that's good or bad. Um, Amazon, at this point, probably has more control over the internet than we ever thought any government could possibly have, right? Um, they basically own a good portion of it. Um, and so there's some open source projects that we should look at as an industry um, and some competitors. Google just announced their Google Compute Engine. Uh, VMware just announced an infrastructure service as well. And then in the open source world, we have OpenStack, Eucalyptus, CloudStack. So there are, are some alternatives. Um, you just have to look and see what best fits your needs. Did you guys see they just announced Glacier yesterday? That is really cool stuff. So Glacier, um, not to sidetrack too much, and this is not a cloud talk, I'll skip on in a second, but Glacier, they're basically uh, allowing people to store long-term data or backups or whatever data, similar to S3, data objects. A gig, it costs one cent, one penny per month to store, right? How much is S3? S3 is quite, quite a bit more expensive. I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I know I pay about, I think it's like $21 a year for my S3 storage, and it's like two or three gigs just that I back up my pictures on. Maybe it's five. And I can do the same thing with Glacier for like, I think less than a dollar per year, right? And it's redundant. And so they, there's some really cool stuff going on with that. Sorry to sidetrack. So that's infrastructure service. At the very top of software as a service, um, real quick, this is when you have no control over the infrastructure or the applications. The most popular ones are um, Google applications like Gmail, um, Google Maps, that's software as a service for businesses. So it's salesforce.com. How many people are using salesforce.com or want to admit they're using salesforce.com? Really? Are you guys just kidding me? They own like 99% of sales automation tools. Um, but, but that's a popular one. And then the next one is platform as a service. That's what we're going to be using today. And it sits in between infrastructure as a service and software as a service. You don't have to manage the servers or the operating system. Um, you just have to deploy your code out. And, uh, and um, there's a lot of benefits for mobile development with a platform as a service. Because as we develop new mobile applications, we don't know if our application is even going to be downloaded or if it's going to be very popular. 
And so with platform as a service, you can actually auto scale your application. And so if it does get wildly popular, you'll be able to scale um, as, it, as it increases in popularity. So we're going to be using OpenShift today, which is actually the open source project that I work on. It is a part of Red Hat. We're, I'm a Red Hat employee. Um, it is an open source community project, though. So with OpenShift, it is fast because we actually do run on EC2 as our infrastructure. It is free. We don't charge for it. So what do I mean when I say free? Um, the source code is free. You can download it. And to use the service is free, including the infrastructure behind it, EC2. So basically, when you sign up, we let everyone get uh, three free servers, three servers in EC2, 512 megs of RAM, and a gig of disk space each. So it's in between an Amazon micro instance and an Amazon small instance. Um, we don't monitor or meter bandwidth or anything like that. And the reason we do it is just to foster um, open source development and to um, help startups get created. Okay. And it'll be free forever. We're committed to that. There's no like bait and switch that we're going to start charging later or anything like that. It, it will be free. Um, so it is fast deployments, and we'll do that today. We'll spin up some servers for our mobile application that we're going to work on and, uh, and create an auto scalable application. So what uh, can you write your backends in? Pretty much everything. Uh, the only language we don't support is .NET. Um, for obvious reasons, because we run on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. I guess you could get Mono to work, but we haven't put any time or effort into that. Um, so all the, the big players in town, like Java, PHP, Ruby, Python, Perl, Node.js, um, works out of the box. We support all the frameworks on top of that. For databases, we are um, huge partners with Tengen, MongoDB. Um, we feel like we have a great uh, place for people to try out MongoDB, get it all up and running instead of having to download it, install it yourself, um, download drivers for your language and get everything set up. And we can spin up some Mongo um, databases as well today. So when we were developing this, and it's, it's uh, been around for about eight or nine months now, we wanted to create an environment for developers so that they can work the way they want to work without having to worry about system management and configuration. So we do have uh, plugins for your IDE, we have REST-based APIs. We work with a lot of the public uh, cloud IDEs, like Cloud9. Have you guys heard of Cloud9, C9.io? You should check that out. It's really cool. Um, they actually use OpenShift for all of their backend services as well. Um, if you spin up application in Cloud9 to use their IDE, um, you're actually using OpenShift without uh, knowing it. Um, we have command line tools. You can then sh have shell access into the servers, um, and we do everything via Git. All right, I'm almost done with the marketing slides, I promise. I hate marketing slides. Um, MongoDB is actually really good on OpenShift. Um, we get the largest uh, free MongoDB instances out there. Um, you can uh, create these, and uh, we have Mongo 2.0. We don't support 2.2 yet, but when that's GA, uh, we'll support that. You can take snapshots of your database. You can do log telling. We have Rock Mongo. Have you guys used Rock Mongo before? It's like a PHP my admin type administration web tool to administer Mongo databases. It's written in PHP. Um, we obviously allow you to use Mongo Shell, and we tie in directly with Tengen and their MMS um, support. So if you want to monitor your database, you just say you do, and then you can log into their uh, MMS dashboard and look and see how your um, MongoDB is going. So like I said, um, OpenShift is completely free. It's open source. If you want to sign up for it, you can. Just go to uh, openshift.com. I did create a promo code if you want to use it. It's uh, no SQL now. And if everyone stops by the booth that I'll be at, I'll give everyone a cool, let's see if I had one, a USB bottle opener. Um, flash drive, right? I think I'm right. And this will make a lot of sense to you when I show you the app we're going to talk about. Maybe. All right, here it is. Stop by the booth. I'll give you one of these after the talk. They're metal, very sturdy, four gigs. They're blank, save so you the trouble of formatting them. Now, the thing is, these open beer bottles very well. 
I've opened hundreds with this little guy. I haven't put a single document on it, so I don't know how well the file storage uh, capabilities are of the bottle opener, um, but I'm not too worried about that. So stop by. So that's the background, so let's put it all together now. We're gonna talk about an application I wrote um, just for fun that is on the App Store. If you wanna download it, it's called Beer Shift, okay? The reason I wrote Beer Shift is I was going to Belgium, I guess about four months ago, and I enjoy drinking beer. Obviously, if you can't tell by looking at me, I probably drink a little too much, and uh, I didn't wanna look like a tourist over in Belgium going into a pub, ordering a beer, and having no idea what I was ordering. So I was talking to some of my friends, and I was like, you know what would be cool is if we wrote an app to where you could type in a beer name, search for it, read about it, um, who brewed it, how much alcohol content it was. And they're like, yeah, that'd be cool. You should do that. <coughs> so I said, okay, I'll go do it. I wanted to learn Accelerator anyway, so I said, I'm going to do this. So I spent a weekend writing it, and then I met my friends again, and as software developers, like we always do, we're really excited to show off you know, what we spend all this time on, and every single time that happens, um, they're just not satisfied, right? So I, I went and I met with my friends, I'm like, here's the app I wrote, it's pretty cool. And they're like, yeah, that's kind of cool. You know what would be better? Is if I could, you know, track that I drank a beer, track where I drank the beer, look at where I drank it on a map, see what my friends are drinking, rate the beers, um, see what everybody around me is drinking. And so I'm like, okay, fine. And so feature creep started setting. So I went back and I added all of those features. And uh, so that's the app we're going to look at today. It's called Beer Shift. And so I'll, I'll exit out and I'll start up my IDE. Can you guys see the source code? Okay. Good enough. So let's, uh, I'll, I'll show you the application real quick. And then we'll spend some time walking through the source code. And this is not going to work because I have the wrong endpoint in here. So let me fix that real quick. Let me reset my device because it caches the endpoint. And then we'll recompile and then we should be good. And I'll also start it in the Android. Um, Emulator, so you can see that the same code base runs natively on all devices. Okay? The Android uh, simulator or emulator does take a bit longer to get started on my machine, so we'll come back uh, um, for that. Okay. So here's the application. The first thing it, it checks to see if I already have a username and password cached on the machine, but because I just reset my um, device, I do not. So I'll go ahead and log in here. I'll say OpenShift. I'll type in a bad password or not. Let me reset it again. These emulators are very finicky. I switch my uh, servers around so much when I'm coding, so one second, and I promise we'll be good to go. There we go. So all of this source code is available on GitHub. It's open source. Um, if you want to download it, muck around with it, get started. I also have a a blog post series that I wrote that's basically how to get up and running with mobile development MongoDB and Titanium Studio. If you want to read that, it's on mongodb.org, it's on accelerator.com and on redhat.com. You can read it in any of those places. So let me log in here. There we go. Now, now we're in business. Sorry about the uh, hiccup there. So when you first uh, log into the application, you get dropped to the search screen. So you can search for a beer. Um, so let's search for Westmall, which is a German beer, or not a German beer, a Belgian Trappist brewery. It's a Belgian beer. Um, and so these are the beers that either contain Westmall in the name or is brewed by the Westmall brewery, okay? And so when I click search, 
that actually made a REST API call up to the uh, cloud, um, OpenShift in this example, and returned the uh, JSON document back to me. So then I can click on a beer, West Mall Trappist Triple, I can read about it, I can select to drink the beer, it'll add it to my uh, drink tab, I can click on a beer and um, see when I drink it, I know it's black right now, um, I'll actually come in and add geolocation to it in just a few minutes and we'll add uh, a mapping component um, to the application as well. I'll click on keg stand, you can see what everybody around you is drinking, and that's basically the app. It's, very, it's a very simple app. So let's go through and look at the source code. Actually, we only have 20 minutes left. So you guys tell me, do you want me to go over the source code for this application? Um, or are you more interested in spinning up some new cloud servers and switch the back end out for this and start with a fresh Mongo database? So wh whoever wants to walk over the source code, including geolocation, raise your hand. W one guy, two, three, four. 50, 50. 50, you want me to split it? Like, how many people want to see the server um, creation deployments? Okay, more people are interested in that. All right, so let's uh, do this real quick. So you can create new servers um, with OpenShift, which again is just running on EC2, one of three ways. You can go to openshift.com and do it via the website if you're not a command line guy. Let me log in here. So I could create an application. And this is, you know, we have these instant apps you can specify. Like if you know you want to do a Spring app running on JBoss EAP, you can select that. If you want to know you know you want to do a Cake PHP app, you can do that. Or you can specify just a language or application type. So that's how you can do it on the web. Inside the IDE, you can go um, file new other, and you can create OpenShift projects inside of the IDE but uh, I'm a command line guy, so that's what we're gonna do. So I'll clear the screen. Okay, so first thing I'm gonna do is create a new server. I'll do rhc app create. Um, we'll give our application a name, we'll call it NoSQL now. And the back end that I'm gonna use today is actually um, written in PHP. If you're not a PHP developer, I also have a Java back end, a Node.js back end, Ruby back end, and a Python back end. Um, so you can use whatever language you prefer, and it's all on GitHub, github.com slash beershift. So I'll, I'm going to create a PHP 5.3 application. Hit enter on that. I'll authenticate. And so what's actually happening right now is it's talking via um, REST APIs to spin up a new EC2 server for you if it needs to. And it's going to create a user account for you on that uh, EC2 server. It's going to install or configure the SE Linux policies and Linux control groups, that's what we use um, to give you quota and uh, tie your processes and threads to a specific amount of memory or a specific number of CPU cycles. It's going to uh, ensure that Apache Mod PHP is installed, all the latest Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6 security errata updates have been applied. It's going to set up a private Git repository for you on the actual uh, remote server, and it's going to propagate DNS out worldwide. So your application and server will be available um, instantly to, to the entire world. And normally that takes about 30 seconds. So we'll give it just a second. Okay, that's done, right? So we now have a new server spun up um, in the cloud. What is your username here? I can see you specify only password. Is your username no SQL now or? No, my username, if I go into my home directory, into the .openshift directory, I have an express.conf file, and I set my default username. Yeah, and so we check for this config file. If it's there, you don't have to pass it in, otherwise you do. So NoSQL now was the name of the, uh, the application we created. Do you have to type the password username? Yes. For, for app creation, you do. Um, you, yeah, there's some ways around it, but we don't recommend people doing that. But yeah, there are some ways around it where you can pass in dash p on the command line and just set it as an environment variable or something like that. So there is no way to do something like 
We do use SSH keys, keys uh, for authentication as well. It's, we do two, two different types of authentication. And I'll show you that. We'll SSH into the box in just a second. So here's my application we just created. And this is going to be um, just a stock application at the beginning. NoSQL now onpasserhcloudcom You can pull this up if you want to and see that it is a real, applica real application deployed out on the uh, cloud, out on the internet. Um, so, so now we have our stock application up. That doesn't do us much good. We want to actually um, take our existing source code for the REST-based web services that we developed <coughs> for our back end and replace this application with it. So what I'm going to do, <coughs> excuse me. Question. Yes. I already have some uh, code that I want to run on some Python environment here. Can I just pull that? Yes, yes. and uh, it'll be this exact same process. Because I have my source code already out here, and we just created a new server with this stock template um, source code. So what I'm going to do is um, we've created our app. Um, instead of beer shift, um, we called it NoSQL now. So the next thing we want to do is add MongoDB to our application. So I'll do that real quick. And to add uh, to a database to your application, you can do RHC app cartridge add. Pass in the cartridge name, which is MongoDB 2.0, and the app name, which is NoSQL now. And again, you can do all of this from inside the IDE and the web browser just by clicking a few buttons. I'm just a command line junkie, I guess. What did I type wrong? I spelled cartridge wrong. Yeah. So assuming I typed it correctly that time, what's happening now is it's doing the exact same thing that it did when we created our initial application called NoSQL Now, except in this case, it's going to um, install and configure MongoDB for me, okay? And it is a private MongoDB. No one else has access to it. It's not shared. You get the uh, admin username and password um, to log in and do whatever you want with it, right? And so that's done now. Um, now we have a MongoDB server up and running. And here's my root user, root password. It created a default database for us, but you can obviously create any database you want. And here's the uh, connection URL for it. So now that we have the database created, let's pull our source code in. Yeah? Uh, just how you would normally do it through Mongo Shell or whatever. Um, yeah. So can you control how many secondaries also, or how many? Get created or how many processes I can't running? hear you. Can you control how many processes are running, like number of secondaries? Um, not today. Um, we are working, like today, with this implementation, this is single server. Um, we don't support shards or replica sets yet. It is coming very soon. It will also be free. If you want to do a three node, uh, you know, I don't know why you'd want to shard a three node, but, but you could, right? Um, up to three servers is free. What do you mean free? So there are, there's no cost for hosting? I'll show you what free means. To use this, all you have to do is come over to openshift.com, click on sign up, and enter in an email address and password. Like, we don't even ask for your first name, we don't ask for your dog's name, your cat's name, what kind of car you drive. So we really don't care. Um, and we provide everything for free, including the EC2 and the structure on the back end. Yes. Yep. Um, we do support uh, people using their own domain names. So if you have mysuperawesomeapp.com, you can absolutely use that um, for your application. So where do you make money on this? Where do we make money? Yeah. We don't. We <laughs> <laughs> um, It costs us. Um, for each one of you um, that signs up, if you were using free servers, it costs us about $111 a month for the infrastructure to support it on the back end. Um, so um, do we charge for this? No. Do we even have a way to accept credit cards? No. Um, what, and this is typical of Red Hat's business model. We like to engage developers and get them excited about open source tools and technologies. So we've provided a great platform for developers to do that with the hopes that uh, they will fall in love with how easy it is to spin up servers and want to do the same thing at their day job in their company, right? And then they'll come to Red Hat and say, hey, you guys have this great 
uh, cloud-hosted service called OpenShift, we want to run that internally in our own infrastructure um, so that the IT operations team can set up 100 servers and say, okay, developers, you know, just go do whatever you want to do and stop bugging us. So it'll be services at that point? It'll be support. I mean, it is open source. You can download this and do it in your own infrastructure today, but large enterprises um, want to pay for, you know, a, a throat to choke at the end of the day, and, and that's where we'll make our money. So there's no limitation on number of applications? Or is no. On, on the free uh, hosted, you get three servers. Um, number of applications really depends. Like, there's no segmentation or context in a lot of languages. Like, if you're doing PHP, you can throw as many applications out there as you want. If you're doing Java, it's, I guess you could, but Java is more like context oriented, and so you'd have to know JBoss pretty well to set up the different contexts for your more files or your files. But yeah, there's no limit to that. Uh, but anyway. It's just email address and password to sign up. All right, so let's pull the source code down um, for beer shift. Let me go back to github.com slash beer shift. Beer shift web is the PHP one. There's also a jQuery and PhoneGap version of this app if you just hate um, Titanium Studio. I've written a jQuery one, um, the Java API, Ruby API, and all that. So let's pull this one down. So, so far we have created the application, we've added MongoDB, so let's pull the source code down. So all I'm doing is, with the first command, I'm saying add a remote source code repository, and then on the second command, I'm saying now take whatever is in that repository and overwrite what I have locally. Okay, so that's all I'm doing, is pulling down the source code. It's going to pull that down. And so one key thing about OpenShift, it is completely non-proprietary. We do not have any proprietary APIs at all. Um, so if you have existing source code, it'll run as it, is, as it is. You don't have to change it. We don't have a specific API to talk to a data store like some other companies do. Um, we're just stock open source databases, stock open source languages and frameworks. So let me add a merge here. So now I have the source code locally. Now to push it up to my OpenShift server, all I have to type is git push. If, and if you're not familiar with git, it's kind of like a subversion commit. I'm just taking those changes I have locally and pushing them up to my repository. So that's done. We're waiting for my uh, application to restart. Let's see if our Android emulator actually started. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> um, so this is the same source code running on the Android device. And notice it does look a little different. On the iPhone device, the tabs are at the bottom. On Android, they're at the top. And I'm, I don't have an Android phone myself. I don't know if that's normal for Android applications to have tabs at the top. Um, but I assume that's why they did it that way. So this is not on the Android market? It is not. Um, I guess I should put it out there. Yeah, there's no reason why I couldn't, yeah. Because it's like 50 bucks to set up an account. Oh, does it? Yeah. Maybe, I'm, I'm too cheap for that. <laughs> no, I'll probably add it. Um, but again, it's just a fun app just for people to learn how to do um, mobile development with MongoDB backends and stuff. And then everyone's welcome um, to work on it. Um, I have a lot of contributors that uh, send in various uh, source code patches and things like that, and translations, because the app is localized in different languages. Okay, so our application code um, that we committed <coughs> has been pushed up to our server, so let's hit our server again. It's called NoSQL now cloud.com. So you can see that that templated website has been replaced with my PHP application. So let's take a look at the Mongo database on that thing. So I can actually SSH to my server that we just created. And this is where we do use um, SSH keys for authentication. I didn't have to type in a password for that. So I'm logged into my server running an EC2. I can type in Mongo. Um, so now I'm running Mongo shell against the Mongo database we just created. I can use NoSQL now, which is the database um, that we created. I think I'd have to look at my source code. Let's see. Show DBs. 
Okay, so we have a NoSQL now, but what I want to do is switch the back end out for the mobile app, and then we'll look and, and see that it's using it. So I can use NoSQL uh, now. We do db.drink.find. Nothing there. db.users.find. Nothing there. So let's go back to our mobile app, and I'm just going to change the endpoint here to be NoSQL now on paths.rhcloud.com. And we'll save that. And we'll run our simulator. And I have to reset it because the endpoint is actually cached on the device. And then we'll recompile the application. And let's uh, log in with NoSQL now. Password of test, we'll log in. We'll say that user doesn't exist yet. Do you want to create it? I'll say yes. So now if we come back over to our server, <coughs> if we do db.users.find, <coughs> excuse me, we should see that that user was created. So it is in fact using this now. I know the password's not encrypted. That's in, intentional. Um, on the production app, it is encrypted, but just for testing purposes, it's not so people can, can see. Um, so, you know, that's how quick it was, and I can do it in like a minute <laughs> flat, right, if I wanted to, um, to create a server. So, let me show you one other trick. I want to do, I want to create a new application, RHC app create, we'll call it Java test, and I'm going to create a JBoss AS7 application. And I'm going to add dash s on the end. And so what dash s does is it tells OpenShift that I want this application to be scalable. And so that changes the state of the application just a little bit. And instead of just creating a server, it's actually creating two right now. It's creating an HA proxy, a high, avail high availability proxy, and it's going to create my JBoss application server um, underneath that. And it's going to load balance just to that one node, right? And so when I add that dash s, that's what happens. And then we actually look every 20 seconds at your number of concurrent HTTP requests. If you have more than five concurrent HTTP requests at any given time, we actually spin up a, a separate um, server for you, whether it's JBoss, Node.js, or whatever, and add it into the HA proxy load balancing. And we do session affinity to, to each server. And so, um, and then we recheck every 120 seconds, and we'll keep adding servers, or we'll remove them. And then we wait using session affinity or sticky sessions, some people call them, for the connections to bleed out, and then we actually remove it um, from the load balancing. And the Wi-Fi failed on me, but uh, but that's the difference between uh, dash s and just creating a normal application. Um, so we have a, no, we don't have any time. Two minutes left. Any questions for two minutes? I'm sorry I didn't go over the source code. That's one of my favorite parts. Uh, but there's just not a lot of time and 45 minutes to go over a full mobile application. But the source code is on GitHub. Um, if you're interested in looking at it more, like I said, there are blog posts. And uh, OpenShift is completely free to use. Yes? So you said it's open source. Um, that means I can deploy it on my own server. Yep. Uh, how would that involve? Allocation of resources on ECU? No. If you want to run it on your own servers, you can use any infrastructure that you want. Um, by default, we can even provide you a, a ISO image that runs on top of Fedora, and we use KVM for provisioning. But if you use VMware, or even if you just use bare metal or Rev or whatever the case is, we do not care what hypervisor or how you provision systems. We just care about having a Red Hat uh, Linux distribution available for the system to use. And how you get to that point, it doesn't matter to us. So the part where you allocate the uh, DNS, uh, that's not part of that? It is. Um, we actually ship our own bind server with this to handle that. Um, but if you have your own DNS, you would want to switch that out um, to use your, your real DNS server that you're running. Or if you're using, if you're paying for a DNS server. So I could still, I could use it on these yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and people are using it on EC2. We have AMIs, uh, which is the Amazon image uh, available for people to use as well. Yeah. 
I don't know why, like, I would just use us because we're free <laughs> as opposed to paying easy too, but unless you're doing large deployments. Oh, so if I, if I wanted, how does it work if I wanted to use arbitrary domains? Like, uh, you mean domain names? Domain names. Yeah, I can show you real quick. Um, so I have my personal blog, which doesn't have anything on it. It's actually gshipleyonpass.rhcloud.com. But it's grantshipley.com. But if I go to, you know, www.grantshipley.com, it's, it's the same website. And the w way we do it is we have what's called an alias. So if I do rhc domain show, which lists all of the applications I have running, one of these will be uh, gshipley, which is my application name. And then I've assigned an alias to it, www.grantshipley.com. And then I go into my DNS registry and I create a CNAME record and point it over um, to, to this host. So, yeah, you can absolutely do that. Sorry, where do you see that Wherever your DNS is hosted. Yeah, you have to have control over the signatures. Yeah, and then you just point a CNAME to. Um, so, so my CNAME would be, you know, pointed at this. Any other questions, Jim? Does the open source version of OpenShift include the auto provisioning? Yes. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, and you can run it. I run it locally on my laptop. <laughs> I mean, that's just how it is. proxy setup? Yes, it has all of that built in. Yeah. 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 Is one of the interviews on the database? Uh, no, we actually uh, support traditional uh, relational databases, MySQL, MySQL, depending on how you say it. Um, Postgres. Um, what's really cool about OpenShift is that we also have what's called a do-it-yourself cartridge. And so if we don't support something out of the box, doesn't mean you can't use it. A do-it-yourself cartridge basically just spins up a server and gives you SSH access to it. If you want to run Mintash or Redis or, or Reoc or whatever, as long as it runs on Linux, which they all do, it'll, it'll run on OpenShift without any problems at all. Um, but for tie-ins to like monitoring and management, Today in the NoSQL space, it is just MongoDB that we officially support. Does it have to be a JBoss or to be a Tomcat? The question is, does it have to be JBoss or Tomcat for Java? Um, no. I mean, we are agnostic, right? Like, uh, obviously, Red Hat owns JBoss, so we support JBoss. Um, I also just wrote a blog post, and I have a quick start. Like, it's a click of a button. You can get Tomcat deployed out on that, Jetty, you know, whatever you want to run will work. Yeah? Um, so memory, you have dedicated 512 megs of RAM for your application. If you need more, just email me and I'll increase it for you. It's just arbitrary limits um, that we chose. CPU, I don't know off the top of my head. I would have to look and see. Um, but you are guaranteed some CPU. Uh, let's say it's 10%. But you can burst above that, but you're always guaranteed 10%. So, um, so that means that it maps to EC2 micro instance? It's a, no, not really. I mean, it's above a micro instance because what we do is buy um, extra large reserved instances, and then it's a multi tenant environment, and we'll put, say, 10 people on nice. one extra large. And so it sits in between a micro and a, a, I forget how big a small is, but I know a micro is like 300. Is six, Oh, I thought it was 300 and something. Well, maybe they've changed it. So if, if, if micros are 600 and something, it's a little smaller than that. We, it's 512 megs of RAM. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, stop by at the booth, pick up your key. Just say I told you to come up there and get one. So they won't make you sign up. <laughs> All right, I, I uh, appreciate the time. Sorry I went over. Um, sorry we didn't go into more detail as well. But thanks. Appreciate it.